It's the George Plaster Show. 30 years of the best sports talk in Middle Tennessee. Featuring Tennessee Sports Hall of Famer Watson Brown. And it's a shame it's taken this long to get an introduction for this Tennessee Sports Hall of Famer, Kelly Holcomb, along with young gun Billy Derrick. And now, here's your host, George Plaster. Hello again, everybody. Welcome in. It is, uh, I don't know, what would we call it? It's kind of a cool uh, Wednesday in April, and we welcome all of you in as we get all the cords out of the way. Um, Feel like we dodged some bullets yesterday on the weather front. Uh, Looks like the worst of it was up toward Louisville and a little bit up into Indiana where it appears they got all the tornado stuff that uh, in in some cases had been predicted for us. Next four days are going to be a little cooler, upper 50s, uh, but it will get back to where we want it to get pretty soon. So with that in mind, let's go to Murfreesboro. Say hello to Kelly Holcomb. Kelly, how are you? Good, George. How you doing? I'm good. I'm good. It's funny. After we've had upper 70s for a few days, the drop to 50 feels like the 30s. Yeah, well, welcome to March or April now, excuse me, in Tennessee, because the the weather, you know, everybody says that all over the country. I remember, hey, just wait for a second and the weather will change. Well, that's everywhere. I get so sick of people saying that, but like here in Tennessee, I mean, Danielle Breezy, I was listening to her last night. Oh, I know night. you were. She was and she through. and she talked. Yeah, yeah, she talked about in the next couple of days they might have snow flurries in like Cookville, and I'm like, you've got to be kidding me! But that's, what? I mean, it's hot, it's cold, it's hot, it's cold, and then at some point it'll it'll measure out. But right now it's just too unpredictable. Billy, how yep. are you today? I'm good. Yeah, you get all. You know, everybody's like, yeah. Yeah, I love Nashville. You get all four seasons. Well, I, I don't like having all four seasons in the span of a week. Like true. Uh, I mean, <laughs> correct. You get that in you know in March and April, and I'm. It's a I, good way to get a cold. I am in shorts today, thinking I was going to be That's fine. Absurd. No, it's cold and windy. And what did I try to tell you? You said, Billy, why are you in shorts? I chastised you earlier, and you poo pooed it. <laughs> Nice. All of a sudden. Hey, hey his, his, his mommy didn't lay his stuff out for him this morning, I George, so he so. had to do it himself. Yeah, I don't <laughs> guess so. That along with the warm milk. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we've got a bunch of stories to get into. Update with meat on the bone. Let's talk. Yeah, we're starting with the Preds. They had a tough loss last night, 3 nothing. It wasn't indicative of the game though it was a pretty competitive game it was physical it was 0-0 up until the last six minutes I think when the Bruins scored and then they scored a couple more times they had an empty net goal a goal it was a goalie goalie duel we talk about pitchers duels all the time um what's his name for for the Bruins Olmark had uh 31 saves Bruins have won three of their last four the Preds all of a sudden have lost their third in a row I could care less I am going with the positive They went toe-to-toe with the best team in hockey. No, they didn't win, but Boston is better than Vancouver. They're better than Dallas, and they're better than Colorado. And that's who the Predators are going to see in the opening round. UC is completely on his A game. 29 saves. He was brilliant. I came away. I don't come away encouraged very often in a loss. I could care less that they lost. They went toe-to-toe with the Bruins. I feel good about it. A lot of people on the ride back to the football stadium afterwards felt the same way. Uh, they played pretty good. Yeah. They, they missed the, – there's a couple of chances, one in particular, an empty – you know, an open net. Yeah, see, had a wide open yeah, net. Yeah, and it didn't go. Yeah, the, the Preds, though, they're still three points ahead of the Kings for the first wild card spot heading into or in the Stanley Cup playoffs. So 
We'll see. We'll check those out with Guy a little bit later. St. Louis tomorrow. Not that it mathematically would eliminate St. Louis, but a win tomorrow against St. Louis would pretty much ensure that the Preds are going to be in the playoffs. All of a sudden, that's a big game for, yeah. for both teams. You know, and the Blues are going to be – they're going to be ready to go. So the Preds are going to have to be ready to go too. I'll be ready to go. Oh, uh, we know that. 304-01. A <laughs> lot of Bruins fans in there last Ooh. night. Way too many. But it is their only trip to Nashville this year. And, you know, we were talking earlier, Kelly, about this. If you're a Preds fan and you've got however many games you're going to go to in a season at, at Bridgestone, you can make some money. I mean, why not? You know, that's what I was about to say. Somebody was giving up some tickets and selling them for a nice price, I'm sure. So I guess sometimes you have to do that. But uh, when it gets when you have a big team like that, you do need home ice advantage, I would think. Ask if I did that. <laughs> no, I know you did. You're not. Hey, you, you had. Have you ever done that, George? He would never. Mm, he I'll won't tell. He fifth. won't tell us if he did. I'll <laughs> that's right. He's but not going to tell us if he did. Last night. <laughs> Hell no. <laughs> no, I want I, – I, I use this for me as a measuring stick of where they are. And where they are is significantly better than, let's say, in January. This is a much better hockey team. Um, a three-game losing streak right now doesn't look great, but on the other hand, when you go 17 games in a row where you score points – then you can have a three-game losing streak and not completely crater. Yeah, it was a playoff-type game last night. It'll be another playoff-type on Thursday night. Yeah, physical. So Preds will host the Blues tomorrow night at Bridgestone. Let's go to the NFL. Big piece of news today. The Buffalo Bills have traded four-time Pro Bowl wide receiver Stephon Diggs to the Texans for draft pick compensation. Okay, stop there. Stefan Diggs to the Texans. Doesn't that elevate the Texans, number one, past Jacksonville? Give me a yay or nay, Kelly. Yay, yay. Okay. Are they now a legitimate Super Bowl contender? Whoa, they could be, George. I mean, what, what D'Amico Ryans did with those guys last year with nobody thinking they, yeah, they had a rookie quarterback – and C.J. Stroud, it came out and played good. You're just hoping that's going to happen. hes I don't know if there's a surefire pick, but, uh, I mean, he was one of those guys that in college was really good. Last year he was really good. He needs some. He needs a few more weapons around him. They won the division last year. They're only going to get better when this draft comes around because now, you know, you've lost some guys, obviously, but you've got key cogs in the wheels, key spokes in the wheel, and now you could just play off that and you could start getting more guys. You could start building depth. Yeah, I think they they could, George. You're absolutely right. They could because they've got the quarterback in place. Billy, who gave up what in the deal? The Bills got a 2025 second-round pick in exchange for Diggs, a 2024 sixth-round pick, and a 2025 fifth-round pick. So that's what the Bills got. The Texans got that pick from the Vikings when they traded their 2024 first-round pick to Minnesota last month. So that is what I'm seeing the Bills got. Not seeing what the – obviously the Texans got. I I guess that's all the – it was just – that was it for the Texans. So, Kelly, in recent years, I have seen little tirades from Diggs. A A lot of it aimed at Josh Allen which at some point has to get very uncomfortable. And I would have thought at some point Allen and he would have had some meeting where Allen said, if you've got something to say, say it, but you do it in private. I don't want to be shown up in front of 80,000 people. Is that what precipitated this trade? Uh, Probably, George. I just – I thought that it got – Kind of to that point, you know, they both were very political about it when it went on. I, I can remember Stefan Diggs a couple of years ago yelling at him on the sideline and Josh Allen wouldn't even look up. Uh, 
Right. So you you get guys like that, and that's I mean that's happened to me before. Uh, I, you know, wide receivers those those guys are always open, and then you watch on film, and they're not always open. You know, so they'll come back and say, "Hey, throw me the ball, throw me the ball, throw me the ball." Well, I, I got into it one time. It was against the Houston Texans with a with a young man that was a wide receiver, and then I threw the ball to him, and he it was right in his stomach. He dropped it, tossed it up in the air, and he got picked. So then me and him are literally going at it, going off the field, and I'm saying some pretty unkind words, and we almost got in a fight on the sideline, which I'm glad we didn't because he would have probably picked me up and slammed me because those guys are, are freakish a little bit. So, you know, I was I was mouth and I was mad. I would have I would have gone at him at that point, but it probably wouldn't have worked out well for me. We've got ratings. Iowa and LSU. Boy, do we. We're gonna talk about it. Some real 12, specifics about 12. it later. 12.3 yeah, million it, viewers. Yeah, Iowa LSU, more than 12.3 million viewers for the Elite Eight matchup. And there's some really, really crazy numbers. It averaged 12.3 million viewers. The previous record was set more than 40 years ago uh, in 1983. Cheryl Miller uh, and yeah, USD. Yeah. Uh, that was a big one, 11.8. Uh, let's see, Iowa LSU was by far the most watched show in prime time on Monday. CBS's NCIS was at 5.9 million. So, I mean, everybody was watching this. And this is the biggest stat for me. It had the biggest, the second biggest audience for any game in the men's and women's tournament thus far, behind only the 15.1 million viewers for NC State's upset of Duke. Okay, stop there, because we're going to talk about that later. And how should you view that? Should you view that 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 is simply the public just loving Caitlin Clark? Or is there also a message of dissatisfaction with the other side? Oh, because wow. that is a, good a startling number. Yeah. I mean, reading, because I've got it right here. Ladies and gentlemen, I have an iPhone. Let, let me just say this. If I was a coach, and I know we're going to talk about but if I was a coach, I would much rather coach women than men when you get to that point because women will listen to you. Men at this point in their lives, in this day and age, will not. Yeah, and it's just – it's just LSU too. I mean, it's not just Caitlin Clark. It's what they've created over there. So I think it's, you know, the not. I don't want to say good versus evil, but you know, the the clash <laughs> of those two. Um, you know, because I mean, that's what that's what a lot of people were touting it as. I'm not. So are you was, trying but. to get this Catholics versus convicts? <laughs> no. that's, that's what I was about to say. You're it's, trying not to say it, but yet you say it, Billy. So what's up? I'm 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 just saying they're totally different. You got Iowa, you know, yeah. LSU. I mean, it's pretty obvious. That's good. That's good TV. So, LSU star forward Angel Reese today announced that she's declaring for the 2024 WNBA draft. So she will I'm not shocked. She will not be back at shocking. LSU next year. Really shocking. Yeah. yeah so, seriously. <laughs> <laughs> on the men's side of things, according to a report, Eric Musselman is going to interview for the USC open head coaching position. I knew that Very. was coming. Okay. Very interesting. Let's take a time out there, maybe a 20. So is this him saying, I got to get the hell out of Dodge? Because this is not a lateral move. You can win a national title at Arkansas, see Nolan Richardson. I'm not aware that you can win one at USC. So has the heat reached a different level of smoke in Fayetteville. That's what, it, that's what it sounds like. And if he goes, who's the most likely possibility to replace him? Well, there, there's some and, – and Billy heard the same stuff. We've talked about it. And I'm not going to say this stuff on air, and I'm sure you probably heard it as well, George, but some of the stuff that I heard that was going on in the locker room – it's going to be a hard sell for somebody if the kids stay there. Yeah, there was a – it just didn't feel like – I mean, they were preseason number three in the SEC, and they finish, whatever, 13th, 12th, forget what it is. But there's something deeper there. I don't know what it is oh, yeah. or what it was, but it does feel like he wants to get out. And But you're a check, and, of course, this is AD coach speak here. 
former Vandy marketing and promotions director, Hunter Juracek. Yeah. He says, now this may change tomorrow. You'll have to ask, ask Coach Musselman. <coughs> Excuse me. But we very much want him to be an Arkansas Razorback. We feel like where his contract currently sits, he's compensated in the top 12 to 15 coaches in the country. He's earned that compensation and done a great job. So who, who knows? But USC, hmm. of course, Andy Enfield. There's a lot of this carousel is crazy in, in college hoops. Andy Enfield just left for SMU. He took the SMU job. SMU's coach went to Rice, uh, Lanier. But Bronny James, the best player at USC, or maybe not best player, but we know about him, he's entered the portal. So USC, if you're if you're muscle you're not getting Bronny. So I don't know uh I don't know what, what he thinks. Well now would you be. don't know that because let's say they were to hire muscle. Yeah, maybe you're true. You're right. He might yeah. have the opportunity yeah. to meet with him and say That's true. Stick with me. So a <laughs> lot lot going on in the carousel world in college basketball, but that's and, what I got. And then later today we will discuss the unholy marriage. Between Jimbo and Lane Kiffin. Can you believe it? God. Wait, what? Yes. Jimbo has been hired at Ole Miss. What? Jimbo has been hired at Ole Miss. Who told you that? Would you like me to internet. Pull it up? The old internet. Yeah, I need some proof here, George. Yeah, it's called Do Your Homework. Uh, anyway, research. speaking of which, Terry McCormick will join us after the break. We're going to get into offensive line stuff for the Titans because clearly that is a big need, and we'll go through some of the possibilities. Terry will gloat over the Yankees' uh, opening week sweep of the Astros, which was huge. Stay tuned. It was the most horrible experience that any mother could ever go through. I knew that I needed to get help. My friend, she immediately said, you need to call Bart Durham. And you guys were there within an hour. You guys are like family for us. Yeah, sure is nice to connect with the people that you're doing your best to help. As the trusted premier custom home builder in Middle Tennessee, Donnelly Timmons has over 20 years of experience in the industry. Whether you're looking to build your dream home or renovate your current home, their team will ensure that every client in every remodel is unique, luxurious, and completed on time within budget. Founders Dustin Timmons and Joey Donnelly have over 25 years of construction experience in the Nashville area. Together, they have completed projects in Forest Hills, Oak Hill, Green Hills, Franklin, and Brentwood. Dustin and Joey believe that communication is the most important aspect of all construction projects. Therefore, they personally manage each project themselves and are involved in job site activities on a daily basis. Their commitment to quality and integrity has earned them an outstanding reputation among their clients. Contact them to set an appointment for a free consultation or to view some of their completed projects, give them a call at 615-456-7983 or log on to DonleyTimmons.com. I'm Watson Brown. I'm Kelly Holcomb. I'm Billy Derrick. We're the George Plaster Show. We've been Nashville's best sports talk for the last 30 years. And you know what? We still are. Catch us live weekdays from 2 to 4 p.m. Central Time in Nashville on YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook. Also, the podcast version is available on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Looking for more than just awards and trophies? Southern Trophy House is your one-stop solution. For over 60 years, their team has created lasting impressions with a personalized touch. From embroidery to screen-printed apparel to corporate awards, signs, and name badges, they have everything you need to keep your brand shining bright. With their knowledgeable customer service team, you can relax 
as they create, produce, pack, and ship merchandise and awards on time and on budget. That includes etched crystal awards, custom cut acrylic, name badges, embroidered Richardson ball caps, banners, screen printed t shirts, laser engraved Yeti cups, and knives. Recognize your hardworking team from Southern Trophy House, where they do their best to help you recognize your best. Located at 2705 Nolansville Pike in Nashville, give them a holler, 615-256-7295. Visit southerntrophy.com, Southern Trophy House, for all your personalization and recognition needs. How do I look into a camera and say this? I've taken on water. You got got. Go. Rumor mill. Hey, he got got, Billy. Oh, no, no. There's, there's, a, day, April there's a day called, there's a day called <laughs> April Fool's, George. <laughs> so this should have given it away for me. Yeah. Reached for comment about the hire of Fisher. Uh, Ole Miss quarterback Jackson Dart remarked, quote, I'm not sure what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> so the story describes it as a virtual role <laughs> that will nonetheless have a materially significant effect on game day preparation and schematic decisions. So it's awesome. It's just about the time you think nobody awesome. is dumber than you. I present me. <laughs> God, God. <laughs> Hey, that's why you have to you have to verify and validate everything on the internet because there's so much crap on there that you just you can't trust. This is the second one of these I've gotten fooled on this week. <laughs> uh, I've got to be more careful. Terry McCormick, Main Street Media, joins us to talk offensive line uh, stuff. I've never been more happy to move on to offensive line territory. Kelly, uh, I mean uh, Terry. Of course, sporting. Um, no Yanks. Yeah, whatever. No um, Yanks, baby. So You're back. So <laughs> the four game sweep automatically gets you to we're back. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yes. You're we are about. back. I went out and beat on a trash can to celebrate. Did you really? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good. That's good. Let's see if I've got. Yeah, there we go. So, uh, is it as simple as put your money down on the Titans to select Joe Alt from Notre Dame? You would think so, but there's also this thought in some people's minds that Jim Harbaugh will want to rebuild the Chargers offense and take Joe Alt for himself. Now, mm. that said, the Chargers, after having gotten rid of Keenan Allen and Mike Williams, are also in need of receivers. So Marvin Harrison Jr. or Malik Neighbors might be their preference, and they can address the offensive line in the second round. So if Joe Alt is there, I think the Titans would have a hard time passing on him. So l let me try it this way. Um, if um... – if Alt is not available, does that end the Titans' search for an offensive lineman in the first round? Not necessarily. I think, uh, you know, a lot of people like this kid, Olaf Fashionu from Penn State. And uh, there are some other guys. Now, J.C. Latham of Alabama, but he's been primarily a right tackle. Do you want to, you know, do you want to gamble that Bill Callahan can switch him over to the left side and make it work? Maybe. Uh, do you want to wait and go and get a guy in the second round? Because there are several players that uh, were at the combine and that are, you know, top prospects uh, at that left tackle position that maybe they feel like Callahan could take at number 38 overall and develop. The other option would be, and I think this is certainly one that the Titans would have to look into if Joe Alt is not on the board, is trade back pick up an extra pick or two, and then 
draft your offensive tackle with wherever you fall to in the first round because there should be some available in that range. Okay, let's try this one. Do you think they have eliminated Brock Bowers from consideration? I don't know that they would take Bowers at seven, but if they traded back, I would think that he would be an absolute, uh, you know, possibility in terms of, you know, guys that would be there, say, in that maybe 10 to 15 range. You know, okay. I, I guess that's a question that we probably should have posed to Rand Carthon yesterday, even though he wanted to talk free agency and not the draft. But when it comes to the draft, you know, there are premium positions. There's quarterback, there's left tackle, there's uh, edge rusher, and then some people would say wide receiver thrown in there too if it's truly an elite talent. But do you spend a premium pick on an elite player at a non-premium position? A lot of people would say, no, you don't do that. You don't take a top 10 pick and use it on a tight end or an inside linebacker or a safety, even though it's been done before. You know, and uh, used to it didn't really matter. But now more so as the league has gotten more specialized and it's become such a quarterback receiver league with all the, I guess, focus upon that most teams that are picking in the top 10 are looking for help at a premium position well i'm with kelly in this day and time cornerback is a premium consideration because if you don't have corners you're screwed no you're absolutely right and you know you can bolster the pass rush and make the corners a little bit better help them out but certainly when you go get a guy like the Titans did in Legereus Sneed, that, that's a major upgrade at that position, and that takes at least the immediate uh, need off the board for them in the draft where they can maybe spend a fourth or fifth round pick on a cornerback if they want to and have that guy be developed for depth. Okay, let's take a look. We're going to project Joe Alt to the Titans. In, in what it is we're about to put up here. This is, for the moment, Terry, what you believe their offensive line would look like if they drafted Alt and really didn't make any other moves. Talk me through that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I think that would entirely fix the left side of the line. The right side, there would still be some question marks. Daniel Brunskill started most of the year at right guard last year. He's an okay player, probably better as a depth piece. So, and they've already pretty much stated that Dylan Radens, they see him more as a guard than a tackle. So, Brunskill, maybe Dylan Radens there, maybe this guy that they signed uh, away from the Washington Commanders, uh, Shadik Charles, perhaps he gets into that guard tackle mix on the right side as well. Uh, Nicholas Petit Ferrer. Titans have been waiting for him to blossom to see if he's going to become anything after he was a third round pick a couple of years ago. I think he, unless they go out and draft or sign somebody else, I think he probably gets the first crack at the right tackle position, but it's also possible that uh, Jalen Duncan last year's sixth round pick or Charles, or maybe even Raidens could get in that mix at right tackle as well, because right now it's just kind of sorting out, you know, who fits and who doesn't and who who steps to the forefront when given an opportunity. Deep down, are you surprised they didn't work on that right side in free agency? A little bit. I mean, there are some guys that maybe could help you a little bit. Uh, Makai Becton is one that uh, comes to mind. Uh, but by and large, right tackle is starting to get sort of like left tackle in that you've got to have – somebody who can protect the quarterback because a lot of times some of these teams that have a stout edge rusher on both sides, like say the Cleveland Browns, you know, they're going to, you're going to have to have a right tackle that can hold up almost as well as a left tackle that can hold up. Or you can keep a tight end or a back end to do some chipping and double teaming on a guy uh, on occasion. But uh, you know, that guy's still got to be able to win his share of one-on-ones. I'm a little surprised, but, you know, like we said with left tackle, the best ones don't get the market uh, right tackle very often either anymore. Yeah. So let me bring Kelly into this part of the conversation because when you read all the draft stuff, and admittedly, 
it, it, it's just that it's it's bathroom material oftentimes but what they all kind of put out there is that Joe Alt is up here and everybody else is a step below him why is that what what is it that separates him me either way go ahead yeah. Terry Oh, okay. Oh, Terry's in first place. He's got to take a, <laughs> a leadership position. Right. Well, I think that I think what most people see in Joe Alt is that not only does he have a high ceiling, he's more of a finished product. He's a guy who can you can plug right in and start and shouldn't have a whole lot of problems, even though he's a rookie, uh, shouldn't have a whole lot of problems holding his own right away and then should only get better. A guy like Fashionu is regarded maybe as a little more athletic than Alt, but also needing a little bit more work, a little bit more of a project. And while you probably, if you're drafting him in the first round, would still play him immediately as your starting left tackle uh, based on what you have on the roster, uh, it might take him a little bit longer to start to feel his way around and get used to the rigors of being an NFL left tackle. And, there are some people who will tell you, like you said, George, with Alt being the clear-cut number one, that there may not be as much difference in fashion who and whoever they regard as the third or fourth tackle in this draft. There may not be as much difference in him as there is between fashion who and Alt between one and two. So, so, Kelly, so yeah, go ahead. Well, so all I was going to say is, George, but this is a this is an integral part. Like, if you make this pick right here, like this guy could be there for a long, long time. Uh, you know, you look back to Bruce Matthews. I mean, he played forever. He was kind of a stalwart on that offensive line. Uh, he was always available. He was never hurt. That's what all that combine stuff is, and that's why they interview those guys because they want to, just like Terry talked about, the maturity level. They want to look at all that stuff. And uh, it just seems like, you know, going through the interview process that, you know, Alt may be a better guy right now, but that's not saying that the other kid or the other guys couldn't be that as well. So uh, they just might need to take a little bit more time. But it's a huge pick when you make a pick that high as an offensive tackle. You better know and know you know. Okay. Now, Billy, of course, worships at the uh, Notre Dame altar. Oh. Uh. God knows we have heard it. Um, so you've watched him a bunch. What do you see? I mean, he's huge. He's big. He's physical. I mean, he can he can really move too. He's he's tall. He's he kind of think of a guy like a Taylor Lewan, but he's even more physical than than Taylor Lewan was. Lewan was more of a kind of that new age type left tackle where you know he's maybe not as physical as as uh, Alt is, but Alt. He's got everything, and and I agree with Terry when he says that he feels ready. It feels like he could step in and, and really play well. Now, there's a lot of pressure. There will be pressure on him if the Titans take him, and so I don't I don't know that that, that would be fair, but I think Alt is, would be up for the challenge, and, I mean, he played at Notre Dame, so, you know, and he dom- – I mean, I mean, he dominated. If you look at his film, just turn on his film, whether it's run blocking, pass blocking, he's – He's a physical specimen. Yeah, well, he's huge. There's yeah. no doubt about that. So, Terry, on the, the Charger front, everybody now believes that the first four picks are going to be quarterbacks, right? That's what a lot of people are saying. A lot of people think that if the Cardinals, you know, that there's an outside chance they're not uh, just so enchanted with Kyler Murray that they wouldn't draft a quarterback. But uh, – you know, there's people who think that they might trade that pick and that the a team like the Minnesota Vikings or the Denver Broncos could wind up in that number four hole, uh, picking J.J. McCarthy most likely if he is the one that is left over uh, after the early run on quarterbacks. I think pretty much it's a lock that Caleb Williams is going to be a bear. Then with uh, the number two pick, Washington is probably either going to go with Drake May or Jaden Daniels, and the Patriots would probably be with the other one, uh, barring any moves. So it's going to be interesting to see what is there when the Titans pick at number seven if quarterbacks go in the first four slots. Because if they do, then they're going to have their choice of one of these three players at least, and that's going to be the two wide receivers in Marvin Harrison Jr. and Malik Neighbors and the left tackle in Joe Hall. 
Do you really think, given how bad they sucked a year ago in the offensive line, that they dare go away from it? Because, uh, B- Billy, put that thing back up there. Um, because here, here's the fair question. If it's not alt, then what? Well, if it's not alt, then you have to go and work your magic uh, with Bill Callahan as an offensive line coach and draft an offensive lineman in the second round and hope that he can get that guy coached up and ready to go by the time the season starts. So, I mean, this is a deep offensive tackle draft. And, you know, it's like we've discussed on here before, and Kelly, you know, feel free to chime in and agree or disagree. While Joe Alt might be the guy, if a guy like Marvin Harrison Jr. or Malik Neighbors, if you feel like they're a generational talent, if they if they make what you do, which is throwing the ball now, if they make what you do that much better, then you jump out there and you take them and you add another weapon for Will Levis, and then you figure out how to protect him uh, as you go through the rest of the draft. I, yeah, I, I tend to agree with that. Although I think with the with the signing of Calvin Ridley, I mean he's still a good football player. He was in Jacksonville last year. He can, still can play. So I mean, I, I thought I think they they upgraded their wide receiver room obviously, and they said that they didn't think they were going to trade Traylon Burks, is what I read. So. Traylon Burks is obviously staying around, and obviously some of the pressure will be taken off him. So maybe he can flourish in a role like that, and maybe he can be something because now you've got DeAndre Hopkins, you got Traylon Burks, you still got the Moore kid, right? I mean, is he still on the? Oh, yeah, he's, he left. Chris Moore left. Oh, Westbrook Akine oh, resigned. Oh, okay, so Westbrook Akine, which is which he made plays last year, and then you've got Calvin Ridley. So I, you know, I, I like that. I, I'm just wondering, like. I'm with you about the tight end. I bet people would want to go back and get Travis Kelsey if they could. You never know how guys are going to turn out. I guarantee you he would be a top five pick now for somebody, but I'm kind of with you on that. I just think Brock Bowers, I I think that that's one. If you look at what they've done, they've got to get a tackle, which we we know they're going to get at some point, but you've got to get another tight end, I I think, because I think that would round out your offense now the petite free air and the and the brunch school kid I, I get it i mean i understand that but like that line that y'all just put up there is significantly upgraded from what they had last year so i i you know i, I don't know what you do I, I don't know if you like trade that pick like you were talking about maybe you you like joe alt but you can get by with some of these other guys and then maybe you can pick up another draft position in the first round if you trade that pick so I don't know. That's why they get paid the money, but that's intriguing to me. Kelly, hold yeah, on. Both of you hold on to that thought. Let's go to the break, and then Kelly kind of reestablish that with first place Terry, and we'll see where we go from there. Stay tuned. Right. We'll talk more Titans draft stuff, offensive line version, when we come back. Hit After Hit has become the baseball store in Tennessee. They have over 1,000 different models of gloves and over 1,500 wood bats. They also have several iron mic pitching machines as well as a hit tracks machine. If they don't have it, you probably don't need it. We're proud to call Hit After Hit the official shirt provider of the Plaster and Friends Celebrity Bowling Night. Forget the fact that Sir Speedy Music City is owned by my BGA classmate James Warren. Their work stands on its own merit. James and his staff do incredible work, as evidenced by the huge banners at the Plaster and Friends Celebrity Bowling Night. If you're looking for quality to help your marketing and business communications and you want it at a reasonable price, these are your folks. Call them at 615-832-9511 or go to print at sirspeedymusiccity.com and be sure to tell them Plaz sent you. Over the years, more men have started to seek help for hormone deficiencies and imbalances. And Dr. Jeffrey Lodge and wife Daphne, along with their experienced staff, give men the treatment required to improve their quality of life, improve your immune system, energy level, cognitive function, and more. There's no better time to achieve a healthy lifestyle 
What are you waiting for? Give Cool Springs MD a call today for an appointment at 615-486-3458 or visit the website coolspringsmd.com. For over 35 years, Wilson Bank & Trust has been committed to providing customized banking solutions to help individuals, families, and businesses in Tennessee achieve their goals. As your full-service community bank, we are proud to offer loans with competitive rates, local decision-making, and fast, friendly service from our experienced lenders. No matter where you are on your financial journey, Wilson Bank & Trust is ready to help you take the next step. Visit your nearest Wilson Bank & Trust office or online at wilsonbank.com to get started today. Member FDIC, Equal House. Lender. Convenience and value, two words that we expect when we do business. Our goal at JHA Company is to deliver just that, both to our school partners and to our customers. Whether you're purchasing photos, yearbooks, class jewelry, letter jackets, school spirit wear, or senior graduation products, we strive to make the experience easy, convenient, and cost-effective. Find out more at jhacompany.com or call 615-867-6345 for more information. JHA, one source, one company. Okay, as most of you know, a uh, glaring need for the Titans is offensive line help. Not exactly uh, a big breakthrough knowledge-wise to say that. And so the, the first of these draft updates that we will do involves the offensive line where Joe Alt is the big guy. Now, let me make sure I got this right, Terry. It's your belief the only scenario – where he doesn't fall to the Titans is Jim Harbaugh Chargers. And and that appears right now to be the only way they wouldn't get him if they wanted him. Yeah, I mean, that would seem to be the way things are starting to shape up. Now, obviously, the draft is still three and a half weeks away. So uh, it's a matter of, you know, there's a lot of uh, – theories and a lot of rumors being put out there but uh, from you know what you kind of read and ascertain and talking to people it feels like that uh, Joe Alt is uh, on the Titans radar uh, unless the Chargers uh, jump up there at number five and take him away. Kelly your witness. What do um I just was I just was thinking the other day, Terry. Well, you know, because I've said it on this show already that I think it's what happens when you have a lot of salary cap room. But what do you think the Titans have done so far with all these guys they brought in? Tony Pollard, Calvin Ridley, uh, the Cushionberry kid, uh, Legarius Sneed, uh, Mason Rudolph. Even I even talked about that. I think he's the perfect guy to come in and fit because. He's never really been a starter. He he came in last year for the Pittsburgh Steelers and did really well when he had to play. And you you want a guy kind of like that that's not going to come in and, and upset the apple cart with Will Levis because I think that they're wanting him to obviously to start. But I think he's that guy to kind of help him. He's a pro. He's experienced. He's been there. He's done that. And he's not going to upset the apple cart. So so like kind of give a grade of what you think Brian Callahan and Rand Carthon has done so far, or they did in free agency? I think they've done pretty well so far. I just have to give them a B at least because I think they've addressed a lot of the needs this team had. I think we all knew that they weren't going to be able to probably address every single need with a top quality player at every position because there were so many holes to fill. And this is the analogy that I used in that when you – Fill needs in free agency. You're repaving. You're you know you are patching the potholes that are in the road. And when you fill needs through the draft, you are repaving the road to make it better for the long term. So I think the Titans are right now in patch mode, and that's what they've done in free agency. And they've done a pretty good job getting guys like Tony Pollard and Calvin Ridley, who are going to help them in terms of you know being able to open up this offense and build it around the passing game and throw in the football with Will Levis. They did a good job of getting a veteran center who can help anchor the line, make the calls, 
make things a lot easier on Levis. And then when they went about rebuilding the defense, you make the trade for Legereus Sneed, who is a lockdown number one type cornerback. We can play man to man and in the type of defense that you want to play, where you want to be aggressive, but you want to be able to cover on the back end and not surrender a lot of big plays. Over on the other side, you've got a veteran in a woozy who uh, should be able to hold down that side while Sneed handles the other team's top guy. And then you added Kenneth Murray, who's an athletic linebacker who maybe hasn't quite reached his potential yet. Uh, he's a former first-round pick, so you know there's some talent there. And then you added this kid, uh, Sebastian Joseph Day, who uh, you know can help fill in some of what they are, were missing on the defensive line through some defections and whatnot. I don't know that he's going to replace Danico Autry. I think he's more probably akin to replacing, say, Tier Tart in the middle of that line. Still some holes to fill. There's some you know, safeties out there that, that could be had. There's, you know, some other uh, inside linebackers and some edge rushers maybe that you can get for depth pieces. But I think they're going to have to start addressing the rest of the holes on the, in the draft. Kelly, I want to I want to ask you you a question too as we go back kind of to the offensive line. Uh, were, were you with the Colts when Howard Mudd was on out there? I, I was the best offensive line coach I was ever around. Okay. Now, Bill Callahan has that reputation of being able to, as an offensive line coach, make chicken salad out of you know what. And right. when you look at guys like Nicholas Petit Ferrer or Jalen Duncan or Dylan Radens, guys like that that have knocked around here for two or three years but haven't really uh, found their role or fulfilled what their draft status was, when you were in Indianapolis, how much of a, how much of a, I guess a difference did Howard Mudd make coaching up guys, breaking bad habits, or getting guys fixed that needed to be fixed so that they could play on the line and contribute? He was very integral in that man. That that guy was the best. I mean, he played for the San Francisco 49ers win. And that guy was the best O line coach I'd ever been around. Now we only had three concepts when we had the run game. We had we weren't a gap, we weren't a, a gap scheme team. You know, we didn't run power and counter and things like that. We only ran outside zone, inside zone, and sprint draw. So he worked on that constantly. That's all he did. That's kind of like Alex Gibbs when he was at uh, Denver. That's what he did with Terrell Davis. I mean, he, there's so many things that, but you have to you have to work on that each and every day. So. Howard Mudd was unbelievable, man. He took Jeff Saturday, who I can remember the first day Jeff Saturday started. You know, he went to Baltimore, and he never he never made it there. He was a free agent coming out of college out of North Carolina. And Steve McKinney, our, our offensive guard, woke up one morning and had uh, appendicitis. So he had to have an emergency appendectomy at the hospital, and we were playing the Philadelphia Eagles. And I can remember Jeff Saturday was going to have to go in and play guard and then he went in and he didn't miss a beat. And I can remember Howard Mudd and those guys talking. I didn't realize this guy was going to be this good. But, like, I think Howard Mudd was the guy that helped Jeff Saturday get over that hump. And now Jeff Saturday's going to probably at some point be in the Hall of Fame. Uh, he was that good of a player. So I just think that uh, it's it's huge in having a, a an O-line coach that I've told people this before, uh, Terry and George, like the, the first hire and they didn't, they didn't go by my first hire, Brian Callahan, but I think you got to have a strength coach. But then after that, more than the offensive and defensive coordinators, you better have an O-line coach because if the O-line coach is really good, I mean, you got to have a guy to call plays, but the O-line coach is the integral part of the offensive staff, man. That guy's got to know what they're doing. And Howard Mudd, was unbelievable, and he took guys from this level to that level just by the way he coached, and and they had an affinity for him because he played. He had been in the position, and, and I think Bill Callahan is kind of on that same wavelength, man. You hear he's kind of the O-line guru, and he will help those guys that you were talking about. He'll give them confidence. He'll meet with them. He'll overly, overly be involved with those guys and each day put those guys through drills, and I think people next year will see a significant difference in the O line play just because of him. Well, that makes me that makes me wonder if that's maybe the reason why they've not delved into free agency to fill that right tackle spot. They're either going to 
go with, you know, a third or fourth round pick if they can get a third round pick and maybe do it there. Or maybe he sees something in a Jalen Duncan or a Nicholas Petit Ferrer that can be brought out to make them a useful player. I think you're absolutely right, man. I, I really do. And I, I can't explain, like, in today's coaching world, guys, uh, there's not a lot of great coaches anymore, in my opinion. Now, you get some guys up there, but it's it's the good old boys league. And you, you get guys that, that, you know, when I was around, I'm like, how is this guy an NFL position coach? Because he knows nothing. And, and that's just, I mean, that, that's the case at every level. But, like, this guy – is really good, and I, I really think that he will give those young guys that that you know hadn't blossomed into their career so far. I think that he will make them into better players. I really do. So, let let me ask you this, Terry, about the we all I always ask you about quarterbacks and the quarterback situation. With I'm always bringing up Malik Willis, but I just read where they're going to have Mason Rudolph and Malik Willis fight for the job. Understand? I get that. That's what they got to say. But is that going to be truly the case? Because if Malik Willis does win the job, I mean, do you think those guys will be comfortable with him? Well, I don't think he's going to beat out Mason Rudolph for the number two that's, job. Because Mason true. Rudolph has a proven track record of being a at least a moderate-level starter and high-end backup uh, during his time with the Pittsburgh Steelers. I mean, he was one of the reasons that they made that late run and got to the playoffs because they were not pleased with what – Pickett and Trubisky had done uh, at the quarterback position, and Mason Rudolph was able to go in there and lead them to three straight wins down the stretch, which put them in the postseason. So as far as Malik Willis, I mean, it's just one of those situations where it, it just doesn't seem to be a fit. Now, if like we talked about with Bill Callahan on the offensive line, if he could find a quarterback guru that he clicks with, then maybe he could turn turn it around and and, you know, something would click for him and he, he could be a decent quarterback in this league. I think he's made some improvements, but I also wonder if you're changing the offense again, if you're changing it, he already was in a spread system at Liberty. He comes to the Titans. They're in a play action vertical type game. Now they're going to go to more of a wide open approach. And I don't know. I mean, can Malik Willis adapt to a third system in, you know, four years? I, I don't know if, whether he can, he hasn't done, he didn't do very well in the play action vertical, which I understand he was the square peg in the round hole. I don't know if he'll fit better here. I, I just, I feel like the writing may be on the wall for him. I'm kind of with you on that. So, so let's go a little further with the quarterback deal. So they've got, they're going to take four quarterbacks to camp more than likely, because you got to have, you know, and this is really bad because I was one of those guys, you've got to have a camp on them. You got to have guys that, you can come in and maybe show you something, but do you think that they'll they'll maybe draft a quarterback in later rounds, or do you think they'll just bring in a free agent at some point? I'd say either is an option. I, I would tend more to go with an undrafted free agent simply for the fact that they have so many needs to fill at other positions that they probably can't even risk pin, spending a six-round pick on a quarterback because – that six-round pick could turn into a linebacker that might be useful uh, in a year or two to help play uh, in a regular role. Whereas a quarterback, a, that taken that late in the draft, you know he's not going to be any more than a third stringer, at least for the first couple of years, while you've got uh, uh, Will Levis developing and you've got uh, Mason Rudolph here under contract for this year. So to me, it's probably more the undrafted type. You know, I mean, you know, I'll throw this out there. If Joe Milton is still sitting there in the sixth or seventh round, would you take a flyer on him? Uh, me, personally, no. But I mean, I, I'm just—I was looking at some of these. I mean, he's rated in the top ten. It's crazy, man. Like I, I just—I've never been a huge fan of Joe Milton. I've like—I like him because I think that he came through some adversity. He could have transferred multiple times like, you know, Jaden Daniels did, but he didn't. He stuck it out. He became best friends, uh, you know, there, there at Tennessee uh, with the other guy, and they got drafted with Hendon Hooker. And I, I, I like him, but I, I would not do that. I, I just – I don't – I'm just not sold on him being a professional quarterback. I think he can throw it through a wall, but I just don't see the accuracy with him. I really don't. I, and, and at that level – you know, I tell I tell high school kids like you can't see my hand, but like you know, just like high school kids, this is open. 
And when you get to college, this is open. When you get to the pros, that's open. So I just I just don't see the accuracy from Joe Milton. But, you know, somebody's going to give him a chance because he's big. He can run a little bit. He's strong-armed. I don't know. That's just me. Go ahead, Terry. Yeah, I mean, I kind of agree with you, Kelly, but I think somebody will give him a chance. Oh, yeah. And, uh, you know, I think – you know, what Brian Callahan and uh, Rand Carthon will look for if they bring a fourth quarterback into camp will be somebody that they can develop and somebody that, you know, like Joe Milton, has a strong arm. I think you probably will have a little bit more accuracy. But I think what they would look for probably, and, and I'm going back to uh, Callahan's years in Cincinnati, somebody that they could kind of develop and bring along like they did with Jake Browning up there. Terry, appreciate it. Look forward to more of this kind of stuff during the draft because there's a lot of uh, interest, a lot of lying, and a lot of intrigue. Right. Have a good one. You too. See you too. All okay. Right. This is the first in a series of Titan draft updates that we will do. Billy. Yeah, it's brought to you by Lori Burnett Leland. You can visit her online at Mortgage Lady. USA.com. That's MortgageLadyUSA.com. And after the break, we'll get to stat of the day, which we have absolutely bombed at uh, the last two or three. Ooh, embarrassing. And then Guy will join us, and we'll talk about the Preds, where they are, and where they're headed. Stay tuned. Venture Express has been helping people in this area for more than 40 years. They're headquartered in Murfreesboro with over 30 years of dedicated fleets involving production, manufacturing, and corrugated experiences. They're an asset-based company with over 700 tractors, 4,000 trailers, and 800 drivers. If you need their help, Dial them up, 615-793-9500, or log on to VentureExpress.com. Star Physical Therapy was established in 1997 with one great mission, to serve. If you're hurting, don't wait to receive physical therapy. You don't need a referral to see their physical therapist and early morning and evening appointments are available. Make the call to 615-673-1420 and get rid of that pain. Star Physical Therapy, the official health provider of Football Friday. Yo, you want to see something cool? No? Well, I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> Step into the scene. No, nobody can do it like me. Zoo pals plate with the kick cuisine. I was the black top king. Three six C's in my green machine. I was a kid and I was breaking down doors. Listening to tribe, now we on a world tour. You were in a crash. Yeah. Your kids were in the car with you. We're very lucky to even be telling this story to you. Nikki treated us like family. And she was very caring and loving, and I'm just so grateful for that. She was somebody I could trust, and being a veteran, that's so important to me. My kids are going to have a better life now because I don't have to worry about those expenses that we were out. Your family has really created a legacy of trust, and I would recommend you to anyone. You know, starting to save for your future doesn't have to be difficult. Let Wilson Bank & Trust help tone up your financial goals this year. Our Certificates of Deposits, or CDs, can help your money work harder with our competitive rates, earning you more than ever before. WBT checking options allow you to earn rewards you can really use, like a high interest rate or cash back on check card purchases when you meet some e-banking qualifications. Visit your closest Wilson Bank & Trust office or online at wilsonbank.com to get started today. Member FDIC. Top of the hour on a Wednesday. We're talking Preds with Mark McGee coming up. But first, stat of the day brought to you by John English, Antique Sports and Cards. You can find them out in Shelbyville. They're open during the week, Tuesday through Friday from noon to 5, and Saturdays from 10 a.m. to 5. Give them a call. 
931-492-4304. All right, let's see where we're going today. And I think we're going with a little NIT question. The NIT semifinals were last night at Hinkle Fieldhouse in Indianapolis, uh, not Butler, Indiana State ended up beating Utah. Who won that other game? Uh, Seton Hall in kind of a rout. Okay, so Seton Hall. They were Hall, never challenged. Seton Hall and, in, and uh, Indiana State in the championship. When Lipscomb made the NIT, who did the Bison lose to? Okay, uh, Kelly. Uh, Come on, Kelly. I, I have it. Uh, yeah, I cannot remember, man. I remember the yeah. year they went. Uh, I cannot remember, though. The answer is Tejas. The Texas Longhorns. Boom. Oh, that's yes. Right. Texas so that Longhorns. That was the ch- championship, you yeah. Was that the year yeah. after they made the tournament or before? Was it the championship game or the semifinal? I think it was the semifinals. I don't think they made the championship. Or did they? I don't know. What I remember is that I watched it on the third level of Bridgestone in a television. I watched the first half of it, and Texas had it was, a big run. It was the championship. Was it the it championship? Was, okay. yeah. right. Texas championship. had a big run right before the half. Texas won 81-66 to 66 at MSG. And then three, four days later, um, Casey Alexander went to his alma mater. Yeah. How about that? Yeah. Man, That's he had true. some good runs at Lipscomb. He did. He's a good basketball coach. Lenny Acuff at Lipscomb. Both Another really good, good basketball coaches. I would not want their jobs right now because they are mm-hmm. simply being used as feeder systems for bigger schools. And for me, that sucks. It really I does. I agree, man. It really does. I agree. I mean, Lipscomb was able to keep most of their guys. I know one of them le- – I, I think a couple of them left. One of them was a huge uh, – he was a huge part, uh, the Debo kid, that mm-hmm. tore, his, uh, tore his ACL during the year. He he's he transferred, and then the McGinnis kid that came from Cincinnati. They lost he Cody left, Head, so, too. Yeah. So, mm. I didn't see – I didn't know they lost Cody Head, did they? Yeah, Cody Head entered the portal – uh, oh, and wow. I, I don't know if Will Pruitt has yet, but man, he, he that, did not. He did not. Not, and then not the J- going to. <laughs> yeah, not going to. And then the J- then the Jo kid did not as well. So the other side of it, though, is that they get they are able to get some transfers in, um, kind of laterally. Like Belmont got a kid from Furman, Carter Witt, who's a pretty good player. And I think if you're, li- I mean, it's harder still. I'm not saying, but at the same time, they can also get kind of pluck away kids that or maybe overlooked. Yes. I, I'm not disputing <clears throat> that. If this system is allowed to go on much longer in its present form, these schools have no chance. No chance. And, you know, the Sankeys of the world couldn't care less. And mm-hmm. I know I, I pinpoint him a lot because, to me, he's the poster child with a very arrogant attitude that basically says, I don't give a damn about the little guy. Well, that's wrong. He shouldn't have said that. Well, he hadn't said it. He's done everything well, but say it. That's all I'm saying. He implies it. Actions. Oh, he certainly yes. implies it. So we welcome all of you into the 3 o'clock hour from our studios at the Ford Ice Center in Bellevue. Before we bring Mark McGee into the conversation, Billy, let's show people where the standings are right now with about a week and a half left to play. You say, okay, this this number thing is crazy. Winnipeg right now would be the third team uh, in the Central Division, and they would play the two. They've got 96 points. Preds had gotten close for a while. I think you can kind of put that one to bed. The big race at the moment is Nashville at seven, L.A. Kings at eight. Nip it at their heels. And does it really matter? At seven, you get Vancouver. At eight, you get Dallas. Then there's St. Louis, and what the Predators are going to try to do tomorrow night is take the Blues out of their misery. Go ahead and beat them and all but mathematically eliminate St. Louis from contention. With that in mind, 
Let's say hello to Guy. Guy, how are you? I'm doing great, George. Doing great. Uh, yeah, that blues uh, the blues that blues game blooms large. I think it's it's a big it's a big two points right there. It's actually, it's a four point game because the Predators need to open up a little more gap between the Blues because the Blues have played pretty well of late. And um, so, but yeah, it's a uh, it's it's that the wild card situation. Like I said, what does it matter who you play right now? I mean, um, whoever you get is going to be tough to deal with. So. That's part of the, that's the playoffs. It's not very often that I walk out of Bridgestone when the Preds lose upbeat. But last night I was. I came away saying, you know, they went toe-to-toe with what I think is the best team in hockey in the Bruins. And until the breakaway goal with about six minutes left, the Preds looked every bit as good as Boston – and, Guy, I was surprised on the ride back on the shuttle to the football stadium, most of the people on there felt the same way. Well, they should. They should. They played a very good game. They played the Blues skate to skate. I mean, they, I mean, but the, the Bruins, they played them skate to skate. So, uh, yeah, I mean, that, that, the Bruins are tough, and, you know, they're, they're right on top of their division in the Atlantic, on the Atlantic. And um, you know, so, I mean, it, they were no pushover team at all. So it, it, it was strange the way it ended. The three, you know, the Predators have been really good in the third period. To give up three goals in the third was kind of odd. But, but yeah, for the, I think for the most part, the only thing you, you can complain about is they had the power play was non-existent. They were over four on the power play mm-hmm. and didn't have much going. And didn't and what I saw didn't have much going on on the power play when they were on it. And uh, and that's one of that's one of Andrew Brunette's big things is power play scoring. And you know, and so, the, and then special teams gave up a shorthanded goal. So special teams were very special last night, which didn't didn't help them a lot. Okay, let let me try this one on you, because for me, I've been playing this game for about two months now. The scoreboard watching the if the season ended today, who would they play? We now know it's down to uh, Vancouver, which is the most likely. If they end up in the seven hole, that's what it looks like. It could also be Dallas in the eight hole. Uh, I guess it could be Colorado, but I've kind of X'd that out of the picture. If you're down to Dallas and Vancouver, who would you rather play? Well, I re- there's it got, got to explain this a little bit. I, I'd rather play Vancouver, I think. But the only thing about that is that's a long trip back and forth between Vancouver and Nashville. And even if they beat Vancouver in the series, that's going to take a toll on them from a travel standpoint for the se- the second round. But I think that, that but I'd rather from a personnel standpoint have them face Vancouver. Vancouver is up there and they're doing well, but nobody really you know, it's it's hard to really put a finger on what Vancouver's doing at times. But uh uh, the Stars, they played pretty well against the Stars this season, but I just think the Stars have a little more firepower than the Predators do. And, you know, the last time I think they played in the playoffs, the Stars won, it six, won in six games. And some predictions are that if the Stars played the Predators now, it'll probably be six games, and the Stars will probably go, come back and go out in the second round again. So there's a lot of concern about the you – know, the, the, the Stars are, uh, have played well, and they got more of an offensive push than the Predators do, so that's the biggest big concern I have. The only thing about the Stars is they don't play very well at home. Let's let's take the Stars a little deeper because there's always been this: the Stars clog the middle. They want to play two to one, three to two, very low scoring. The team that gets the first goal has a huge advantage. Is it still that way in Dallas? Well, I don't, I don't know that they're offensive, offensively, they're a lot, they're a lot better than they used to be. So, I mean, I, th- I think they're more of an offensive team right now. Uh, so I don't think that, I, th- I don't know if that would be the case at this point, but, uh, but uh, I think that, you know, when you look at the, when you look at the bracket, I just think that right now, like I said, I'd rather play Vancouver. I'd okay. rather play Vancouver. Yeah. You feel that way. And, and I'm starting to lean that way, even though, for a long time, I was stay away from Vancouver. Okay, I want to do one more thing, and then I'll turn it over to Kelly. 
at a time of the year where, you know, we've spent most of the season judging UC and most of the time it's been, well, he's not quite to where he was a year ago when he had four months of unbelievable goaltending. Gee, the guy I saw last night, that's that's UC on his absolute A game. Oh yeah, the, the, I mean, the, there's no doubt. I mean, he's playing he's playing the way you want your goalie to play going into the playoffs. That's for sure. That's for sure. So, um, um, I think that uh, I think that they're I think he is obviously you know, they're, they're going to ride him through the playoffs as much as they can. And uh, and Lincoln is no pushover as a backup if they need him from that standpoint. So, but uh, uh, I you know so I'm hoping like I said. Right now, if, if, if everything ended today, the Predators would play the would play Vancouver, and uh, Dallas would play the Los Angeles Kings. And I'm so, with you um, on the travel thing because it showed up a few years ago when the second series was in San Jose, the first series was in Anaheim, and so they were in constant travel. Uh, God, the miles they put out there were ridiculous. And the NHL didn't do them a lot of scheduling favors as far as how much time they had between games. And, Gee, by the time they got to game seven in San Jose, they were dead. Exactly. That's what, that's what I was thinking about from that standpoint. Now, I will say this. On the, on the charters, on, on the long flights like that, the players usually change in their pajamas and sleep most of the way as much as they can. So that, that at least that's what they used to do, and uh, when I was traveling with them. So, but um, you know, so they try to rest as much as possible. But it's hard to do that when you're on the road like that. Plus, you have the time change as well to deal with too. So, but you talk about the Jets, maybe they're not catching the Jets, and they they, they missed a chance or two. They sure missed did. The Cody's game was a big, Cody's game was a big loss for them. But I kind of felt like that was going to be a trap game from that standpoint. But the Predators' schedule. The rest of the way through, you got the, they're at the Islanders, at the Devils, you got home game against the Jets, okay, and they they, they go to Chicago, and they go play the Blue, and then they have the Blue Jackets at home, and they finish up with, the, and then they go to the Penguins who are, are having a really off year, so you know they they have a chance to, to win a lot of games there if everything falls, everything should fall their way. The Islanders are just still trying to find a playoff spot right now, so they're a little dangerous. I think the Devils are out of the picture. But other than that, the Jets are the only one in the playoff mode right now, so that the Blues tomorrow night. But the Jets have to play the Predators, they have to play the Stars, they have to play the Avalanche, and they have to play the Canucks in the last few games. Mm, so don't so, rule out the Winnipeg piece in this. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I'm not going to count out for a while because I, I want to see what – the Predators can bounce back, beat the Blues, and then go go up to New York and take, it, take down the Islanders and Devils. They come back against the Jets. That could be a real interesting game. Okay, uh, Kelly, take it from there. Hey, so, uh, of course, George took one of my main questions, which that was his last question that he asked. But, they, hey, there you go. Uh, uh, this 18-game streak that they had where they got points, what what will be your memory of that? I mean, I don't know if you'll remember anything about it, but is there a certain, is there a certain situation or a certain deal in that whole 18-game streak that uh, that you'll remember? Well, a couple of things I'll remember. I'll, I'll remember that the, the the number of goals they scored in the third period, and what the, defensively the way they played in the third period. I remember that that they had that they had a lot of scoring depth at that time. It wasn't just the front line scoring; they had a lot of scoring depth overall. And um, and I also remember that Soros Lincoln had played great in the net. I mean, there's several things to look at there. Defensively, they overcame a lot of injuries. And so, I mean, it was everything. Actually, like I said last week, everything was there. There were a lot of good things to remember about that eighteen game streak. I mean, that's I mean, it's eighteen point streak. There's not much. There's no nothing really to say. Oh wow, I wish they'd done this or whatever. So uh, yeah, it's it's a, it's a memorable. It's memorable as the streak itself, but all the things that add to that. And there were just not just one or two things. There were several things that came together for them to have that streak, the longest in history of the team. So if you're Andrew Burnett, I mean, obviously coming off that and then you've lost three straight, uh, you get no points. Uh, is there anything, if you were in his shoes, is there anything that you would do different with the team, like shuffling lines, or is there anything you would do that would try to get this thing going back in a positive way? 
not this late in the season, no, I don't think so. I think that he's, he did a lot of line shuffling through the season at times, but I don't think that right now is the time to do that because I'm not a coach, but I don't think I want I, – I just think it's a bad time to start, start doing a lot of that. Uh, and, uh, but uh, the, and like, I said, like George was talking about, other than the power play, the power play situation, the special teams, they played a great game last night. You couldn't ask them to play much better than they played. The score doesn't really show it three to nothing, but I mean, one of those was an empty net goal, so if I remember right. And so, you know, uh, you know, it, it wasn't a against against a really powerful Boston Bruins team. Uh, so I, I don't think he changes anything. I think he's very happy with the team right now, other than the fact that he feels like a power play is moving really slow, and for and they play a big game the rest of the time on the power play, they seem to slow it down too much. So I, I don't know if George asked you this earlier, if so I, I apologize. Uh, but uh, leaving last night, Boston Bruins being one of the best teams in the NHL, I mean, did you leave there with a lot of confidence knowing that, you know, hey, we, we can we can do – if we do this against the Boston Bruins, we can do it against anybody? Yeah, that's just what I said. That they played about as good a game as they can play last night. They played, they were skate to skate with the Bruins and they, they until the very end there. And you know, so it was uh, – yeah, that they and like I said, Andrew Burnett had no problems. He thought it was one of the better games they played this season. And the only problem he had was, like I said, with the special teams, especially the power play not being able to do anything. Uh, your special teams did not help, and this time of the year, your special teams have to come through. How have, this is my last thing. So, how have the guys that they added, the Rucker guy and, so, and the uh, Beauvalet guy, or whatever, how you say his name? I don't know how. Have they kind of fit in pretty good with the team? Good, real good with him. He's he's had, he's had a real good transition. Above all, he's not played that much, but but Zucker's played really well. He's done, he's done a, he's done, he's done a great job uh, for them. So since he, he's a, he's been a great addition. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Olivier was a, a healthy scratch last night, uh, or at least I think he was a healthy scratch. I know he was a scratch. Gee, yeah. big game tomorrow night. Thank you, as always, for coming on here. Glad to do it. Glad to do it. Mark McGee talking Predators with us here on the show. After the break, the report card is in. The women's game got an incredible shot in the arm a couple of nights ago out of the LSU-Iowa game. So on the ladies' side, they are cheering this number loudly. On the men's side, there's some questions. What does it all mean? We'll talk about it next. As the trusted premier custom home builder in Middle Tennessee, Donnelly Timmons has over 20 years of experience in the industry. Whether you're looking to build your dream home or renovate your current home, their team will ensure that every client and every remodel is unique, luxurious, and completed on time within budget. Founders Dustin Timmons and Joey Donnelly have over 25 years of construction experience in the Nashville area. Together, they have completed projects in Forest Hills, Oak Hill, Green Hills, Franklin, and Brentwood. Dustin and Joey believe that communication is the most important aspect of all construction projects. Therefore, they personally manage each project themselves and are involved in job site activities on a daily basis. Their commitment to quality and integrity has earned them an outstanding reputation among their clients. Contact them to set an appointment for a free consultation or to view some of their completed projects. Give them a call at 615-456-7983 or log on to DonleyTimmons.com. It was the most horrible experience that any mother could ever go through. I knew that I needed to get help. My friend, she immediately said, you need to call Bart Durham. And you guys were there within an hour. You guys are like family for us. Yeah, sure is nice to connect with the people that you're doing your best to help. The George Plaster Show is Nashville's best sports talk, 2 to 4 p.m. Monday through Friday on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. There's a podcast version available on Spotify and Apple Podcast.
Looking for more than just awards and trophies? Southern Trophy House is your one-stop solution. For over 60 years, their team has created lasting impressions with a personalized touch. From embroidery to screen-printed apparel to corporate awards, signs, and name badges, they have everything you need to keep your brand shining bright. With their knowledgeable customer service team, you can relax as they create, produce, pack, and ship merchandise and awards on time and on budget. That includes etched crystal awards, custom-cut acrylic, name badges, embroidered Richardson ball caps, banners, screen-printed T-shirts, laser-engraved Yeti cups, and knives. Recognize your hard-working team from Southern Trophy House, where they do their best to help you recognize your best. Located at 2705 Nolensville Pike in Nashville, give them a holler, 615-256-7295. Visit southerntrophy.com, Southern Trophy House, for all your personalization and recognition needs. Well, as some of you know, uh, this got out late last night. The uh, women's game between Iowa and LSU averaged 12.3 million viewers on ESPN, according to Nielsen. And I'm going to read you a couple of stats about what that really means. Number one, the most watched women's college basketball game in history. That one's not a surprise. Here's one that just blows me away. Iowa LSU outdrew all but one of the five games in last year's NBA Finals, to which I reply, damn, really? Yeah, that's huge. I mean, (laughs) first of all, Um, the fact that it outdrew the clinching game of last year's World Series, sadly, I'm not shocked at. Um, But let me run a couple more by you. This was the most watched women's game since 11.84 million people viewed the 83 NCAA championship game between USC and La Tech. Uh, Kim Mulkey, the LSU coach, played for La Tech in that game. Yeah. Here's one for you. It was also the most watched men's or women's college basketball game ever. Let me let me do that again. That that felt good. Ever <laughs> on ESPN, more than doubling the prior largest audience. According to ESPN, the 2002 women's national title game between UConn and Oklahoma had the old mark at 5.68 million. The most watched men's game was a 2008 regular season matchup between Duke and North Carolina, which drew 5.61 million, which, first of all, guys lead somebody like me to say wow I didn't realize the viewership between men and women was number one that close and in this case that one-sided because I don't see it in most of the games yes Caitlin Clark everywhere she's gone's put 17,000 in there But when I watch a lot of women's games, it draws test patterns. I see test patterns in the crowd. So where's the disconnect there? I don't know, George. I really don't. I I just know that this this Caitlin Clark, she is a – she's been a generational talent. Obviously, we always talk about that on here. Um, 
she can shoot from anywhere and hit from anywhere. She was nine of 20 the other night. Now I will say this, and she takes a lot of shots. And if I was a teammate, I'd be like, Hey, uh, I would like some, you know, just maybe a three or four passes. But well, I, I'm also getting a trip to the final four. So I'll zip it up. Yeah, I will. Zip it. Absolutely. I will. I, obviously I probably couldn't do that. I would be that guy's like, I wish you would pass me the ball some more. You know, I'm a player too, but you're absolutely right. And she does. I mean, she does. She's a really good passer too. And she gets, she gets her team involved, George. And I, 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 I'm kind of with Billy. I think it was, you know, the Iowa LSU deal from last year. Uh, you know, I, I think it's a little bit of, you know, of the little, arrogance of LSU a little bit with uh with the the girl uh, uh, Angel Reese waving Angel to Reese. everybody I said that I said that yesterday about you know when you do things like that you don't keep your mouth shut you run your mouth a lot people are just waiting for you to fail and when you do they're going to do you know everybody in the crowd was waving at her the other night but hey that's great drama and it got 12.3 viewers 12.3 million viewers I'm just wondering I'm, I'm going to ask y'all do you really think that – I mean, do you think that UConn and Iowa could be even more? With Gino Ariema, I mean, with his with his experience, with all his final fours, with all his winning, uh, with all the things that he's done in the game, I mean, you're, you're talking about Caitlin Clark against the – I don't say evil empire, but – you know, with Gino Ariema, could could they get more than twelve million uh, twelve million viewers? Now that one's on Friday night, correct? That's the semifinal matchup. I think it is. Yes, I think it is on Friday night. Does Friday night hurt that number as opposed to if that matchup were on Sunday night? Yeah, because Friday night's a go out. And yeah, yeah, have a couple of lemonades <laughs> night. <laughs> yeah, but I. I just think LSU Iowa that has turned into the game. You know, UConn is still a draw, but there's not that. You know, there's not that. Okay, I'm I'm definitely watching this. I still think it could get close to twelve, Kelly. I don't know that it gets up to twelve. I could be totally wrong, but I, I just think LSU Iowa that has turned into a rivalry now that Caitlin Clark and Angel Reese are no longer going to be there. Maybe maybe it's not anymore. But because of last year, it started this whole drama, you know, kind of between, even though it might have been overblown. I just don't know if UConn is the same draw anymore. Here's what, here's what kind of blows me away, and I want to get both of y'all in on this. Only one men's NCAA tournament game this year had bigger viewership. NC State's went over Duke Sunday, which was late in the afternoon, 4 o'clock Central Time, uh, Nashville time, averaged 15.1 million. Now, is that the public with a backlash to the men's game at all saying, we're sick of transfer portal, we're sick of NIL, we don't hear it as much on the women's side? What do y'all make of that? I don't think so. I don't think that's I don't I don't think that has anything to do with it. I think I think people forget about that when they're watching these games. I mean it's the it's the NCAA tournament. I think people forget about all that stuff now. You know, next year if it even gets worse, I mean you may be right. I, I, I don't know. Uh I mean with this free agency in college sports, you know, you can't get close to a team. You love Alabama, you love Tennessee, you love NC State, you love Duke. I mean and then it's a total overhaul of your roster the next year. So that could kind of turn people off. But I, I don't think right now, I think this is early on in the transfer portal NIL stuff. So I, I think people just love watching the NCAA tournament. I don't think that has anything to do with it. Yeah, and I think it's more about Caitlin Clark being the the best scorer ever in women's basketball history, one of the most attractive you know draws in basketball history in general, in in any level. I mean, she's a superstar. So, you know, I mean, her numbers are up there with Maravich and, and people like that. So I just think it's Caitlin Clark. And then you combine it with 
the heat of last year with Angel Reese and LSU and Kim Mulkey and uh, you know it's just, there was just so much. So I think it's more of a credit to how the women's game has grown and those two teams in particular as opposed to the men's game going downhill. I mean, I don't – but at the same time, the men's game don't have the stars that the women do. I mean, that's a fact. Sure they do. They just got through showcasing the Talk two the biggest against and, each other. And, yeah, fa- and Caitlin foul me. Caitlin Clark is a bigger draw. <laughs> She just is. Okay, so let me ask it this way, because what she's being viewed at is sort of she is Pete Maravich on the women's side all these years later. She is. When she bolts, does the women's game continue to have these big numbers, or was she a moment in the sun for that sport? I think they'll still have decent numbers. I mean, you've got – Juju Watkins at USC, but yeah, it's going to take a dip. You know, I think she has kind of catapulted it to a certain level where I don't know if it craters, but it's not going to, it's not going to be the same. I think this was a moment in the sun, George. I really do. I I don't know, but I I will say this. I think ESPN has brought, has done a good job with the, with the women's game because they brought it to the forefront being on ESPN. You know, it used to not be a big thing, and now it's on ESPN. And and now they're not playing on the. They they try not to play on the same days as the men. I think the. I think one day they did. I, I can't remember which one it was, but they used to use all these offbeat days not to play with the men. And ESPN did a good job of marketing that. And I will say this: I think that the NCAA or whoever has done a good job of marketing Caitlin Clark. I really do. She's been out there. And now she's got that huge deal with with Dre's Beats or whatever, that big three. And then she's got the huge deal with uh, – is it Gatorade? She's got the huge deal with Gatorade yeah. now. So she's been marketed well. They've, they've jumped on the bandwagon with her and got her to this celebrity status. I mean, I'm sure there'll be somebody come along. But, like, I think you're right, George. Like, there was not a score like Pete Maravich. She beat Pete Maravich's record a couple of weeks ago. But there's never been a score like that in college sports. And now she, on the women's side, overtook him. So, I mean, that's something to be said. I don't don't know if it's a moment in the sun. And there'll be more girls come along. But, man, this was just just a one-time deal right now. And they used it to their full benefit. Listen to this one. This, I guess, is the last one I'll throw out there. It was the most viewed basketball game on ESPN since Game 7 of the 2018 Eastern Conference Finals when the Cleveland Cavaliers beat the Boston Celtics and averaged 13.6 million. Wow. So, one thing, Kelly, going back to one thing you talked about, this year, I noticed this very early. It used to be Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night were all guys' games. And this year what started happening was that they got all the big conferences into Tuesday, Wednesday, and they used more than 50% of their uh, college basketball inventory on Thursday nights on the women, which was a a big change. And what they got – in a lot of cases, when they would show her, were these ridiculous crowds and this stuff like, you know, the average ticket price was $350. And I'm like, oh my God, really? Now, don't get me wrong. She, she's something special and it doesn't take, yeah. you know, it doesn't take much to figure that part out. But Some of what I'm reading here, I got to admit, Billy, I don't know about you. Some of this blows me away. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's crazy. And that's what, like, I keeps going back to Caitlin Clark and and what, because last year they were huge too. And her coming back, you know, I think this season, I don't know where she would have been in the WNBA last year, but she's, you know, she came back and, and I think part of it was that LSU rivalry, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's her. It's it's all it's all about her. She's making she's gonna make more money right now, guys, than she will in the WNBA. 
I mean, she's making a boatload of money right now, especially with Gatorade. I mean, she, like no telling how much she's getting with that stuff, with that commercial she had. I mean, I, I, in my opinion, like I, I've told you all this, I didn't realize that the that the NBA paid the WNBA salaries, but like I, I didn't know that. Like, you know, that's kind of the struggle that you got with the women's game, and I think ESPN has helped that with getting the women's game more exposure. And, you know, I, I've had to go and I, I've watched it for – you know, 12 years now with my daughter playing and, uh, you know, my son, he was here, the, he was here last week and he goes, dad, I just can't watch this. I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, and I, yeah. and I that's understandable. I, I get that. But like, I, I've become accustomed to watching it. I've grown, a, I've, I've gotten an affinity of watching it because my daughter plays it. And I, I'm telling you, like, if I had to coach basketball, I would go the women's route other than the men's route because, they listen to you more and they, they learn the fundamentals more. And it's, it's more of a fundamental game. Like, like as George talked about, when a coach just throws the ball out there, you got to teach these girls. You can't just do that with the, them. And I don't know. I just think ESPN's done a really good job of marketing the women's game. So here's one other thing that I would have liked to have known, but I, I just got through looking it up while you were talking. I wanted to see if there – because the the uh, Iowa-LSU game was 6 o'clock Central. And then at 8 o'clock was USC-UConn. And the, the best thing on the women's side besides Caitlin Clark appears to be the, the young lady from uh, – Paige, Be Paige Beckers, yeah. Well – Juju Watkins. Or Juju Watkins. Juju Watkins, yeah. At USC – so I tried to find it and couldn't. I'm kind of curious what that game drew because that was be immediately following. They had a just a massive lead in. Did it bleed over to USC UConn? Can't yeah, find I, it. Don't I, know. Yeah, I haven't been able to find it either. Just They'll find out because that is, that is intriguing, man. I, I wonder if the people that – Watch that first girl's game, cut it over to the next girl's game to see who she would be playing. So I don't know, George. I, I hope it uh, you know, I, I like it. Like I said, I've been I've been with my daughter. I like watching it. I think it's uh, I think it's more fundamentally sound than the men's game. You just throw a ball out there and and go. But uh I, I don't know. I just feel like this is a one time deal, kind of like a Pete Maravich. I don't know. We'll see. It's a great sports talk kind of question. I so, agree. Kelly, let's end the show this way. The <laughs> reports of my demise are greatly exaggerated. You're coming back. You're darn tootin' I am. You're making people money again. Uh, maybe. Here we go. <laughs> Last there's bet of the day brought to you by Bart Durham Injury Log and McCall 615-242-9000 or log on to bartdurham.com. All right, let's check out what happened last night. Oh, looky here. Wow. Yeah, starting to. Not too shabby. Indiana State barely barely covered theirs, didn't they? No, I think they won. Uh, no, the they, they won pretty good. Yeah, oh, they, okay. they, won, they won pretty good. It was Billy trying to diss my accomplishments. I think, I think he was, man. And I, yeah. I love watching that, like. I told y'all the other day that Avila kid for uh, Indiana State, they've got some really good players on that team. Yeah. But he does not look the part, and that's why you can't judge a book by his cover. No. That that guy right there can play some basketball. He mm. looks like he's got a locker at the Y. Hey, so he looks Indiana like the, State. He looks like that. Yeah, he looks like the average mall walker. Yeah. So Indiana State beat uh, Utah 100 to 90. Uh in front of a packed house mm -hmm. uh, yes. at Hinkle Field House. Billy, I got the distinct impression that a few of those people left before the end of the St. John's Georgia game. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes. They weren't staying. No, they weren't. Uh, I listened to Will Perdue on the uh, national uh, radio after the Preds game, and they were doing a lot of filler. A lot of filler. A lot of filler. Uh, Seton Hall won going away. So now these two teams will play each other for the NIT title tomorrow night uh, 
at Hinkle Fieldhouse. They will sell that one out again. The NIT has found a pretty good little market, good little niche. Mm -hmm. They got lucky yeah. that Indiana State, almost a home team, got them to this point. So tonight, yep. slim pickings, very slim. I decided not to go baseball, not to go hockey, but instead we'll go into the association, the oh. National Basketball Association. Really? Yeah. Gross. Wow. Yeah. We're taking Gross. Phoenix tonight at home against Cleveland. Okay. Nobody cares. Right. <laughs> way to go. Way to go, George. What did you want me to do? You that's like your green. Me? That's like your green sweatshirt. Nobody cares. <laughs> that's a personal foul. Shooting too. That is Te such a technical and the ball. Was, yeah, that's a technical and the ball. That was such a cheap shot. First of all, Kelly, it's for the hell is this thing? It's for one of the most well deserving charities out there i'm sure Last it is minute toy store that's hey i'm sure it is but i'm not talking about them. that even i'm just that, talking about being on you even at that you had to take one of the all-time <laughs> cheap shots i really resent it i'm not sure that you'll be invited back on tomorrow <laughs> okay i hope god man, if that's the case i'm gonna go do something else <laughs> you do it see you tomorrow see y'all Billy, yeah, yeah. try to behave until then. And I'll if try. you can, clean up uh, Kelly's attitude. Tomorrow on the show, Danny Evans makes his 2024 debut. Coach Ron Bargatze gives us a preview of Saturday night's Final Four. We better talk about the women as well. They're the one getting all the viewers. See you tomorrow. Tomorrow.